19 years ago today, at 8.46, on a perfect, crisp, cloudless September morning, an American Airlines passenger jet was flown directly into the north face of the North Tower of the World Trade Center in New York City. 19 minutes later, former Secretary of Transportation Andy Card, the President's Chief of Staff, interrupted the President at an elementary school in Florida to tell him a second plane has just hit the South Tower. America is under attack. At the same time the president was being briefed, the FAA was banning all takeoffs and flights in the Northeast. 20 minutes later, the FAA imposed a national ground stop. Five minutes before that, the New York Port Authority closed every bridge and tunnel leading into New York City. At 9.38, a third plane hijacked by Al-Qaeda terrorists plunged into the western side of the Pentagon. Eight minutes later, we ordered every plane then aloft in the contiguous United States or en route to land immediately. Over the course of the next two and a half hours, some 4,500 planes were all brought safely to ground in the U.S. and Canada. All but one. At 10.03, the fourth, and although we did not know it at the time, final terrorist hijacked plane, rolled over and plowed into the ground outside of Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Passengers and flight crew stormed the cockpit and forced the terrorists to bring the plane down less than 20 minutes before it could have reached the White House or the Capitol. From first blow to last, the worst terrorist attack in history and the worst foreign attack on American soil in 60 years took one hour and 17 minutes. Today, we come together to remember the innocent victims, torn from life and loved ones too early, to embrace the survivors, to thank our FAA and other DOT colleagues who labored to bring hope and order out of fear and chaos, and praise the heroes of that day. Some were firefighters and first responders trained to their tasks. Others were average citizens, forced to make awful choices in fleeting moments. They all risked their lives, and many lost them, in the service of our fellow Americans. So please join us now for the presentation of colors, the national anthem, and a moment of silence in remembrance of those lost on this day, 19 years ago. Come forward, march! Aye, aye, aye. Aye, aye, aye. Aye, aye, aye. Colors! Halt! Guards, present! Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the
Each of our four speakers today has a position of responsibility within the Department of Transportation, and each had a unique vantage point from which they saw the events of 9-11 and America's response unfold. We will hear from Stephen Dixon, the FAA Administrator, Timothy Gaither, Associate Director of the Transportation Operations Center, and Carlesta Mitchell, the Supervisory Operations Officer at FAA. Now, before that, we'll hear the, our keynote speech. And today's keynote speaker was the Secretary of Labor on 9-11. From day one, she helped direct the federal government's efforts to restore and rebuild in the wake of the terrorist attack. So next is the keynote address delivered by the United States Secretary of Transportation, Elaine L. Chow. On September 11th, 2001, America was attacked by terrorists, killing nearly 3,000 innocent people at the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and on the plane that crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. The terrorists were targeting America's financial strength, military might, and the heart of our democracy. This was the first time our country was attacked on our soil since Pearl Harbor. Even though years have passed, the terrible events of that day will never be forgotten. The innocent people who perished, their sons and daughters, other family members and loved ones that they left behind will always live on in our hearts. That day changed the world as we knew it. Brave American men and women went overseas to defend our country, to prevent the terrorists from coming here. On this anniversary, I would like to pay tribute to many of our heroic colleagues at the Department of Transportation who played such a critical role on that day. In the hours following the attacks, the department, FAA, air traffic control operations and controllers kept our country safe. They guided the safe landing of approximately 4,500 aircrafts within four hours. Others in the department, alongside first responders, helped to evacuate more than 350,000 people from Manhattan. And in the months afterwards, Still others assisted with the reopening of roads, tunnels, bridges, harbors, and railroads throughout the country once it was deemed safe to do so. TSA was started here at the Department of Transportation, then moved over to the newly established Department of Homeland Security. And Department of Transportation colleagues who were reservists, also joined the call to duty. So in that crisis, the department excelled in every way. The dedication and resilience of our workforce is still evident today, as the men and women of this department help our country respond to COVID-19. Just as before, our country faces unprecedented times requiring extraordinary actions. The department has responded in kind once again, and I could not be prouder of our department and our people. So as we remember the heroes, the fallen, and the families of September 11th, 2001, I hope you will also join me in saluting our colleagues who played and continue to play a vital role in the safety and security of our country. Thank you, Madam Secretary. As you said, the department played a key role in helping to evacuate Lower Manhattan that day. Everyone from regulators at FHWA and FTA to the King's Pointers ferrying evacuees across the East River played their part. The most prominent transportation challenge that day was to airline pilots and crews and the FAA, which had just enforced the first unscheduled grounding of the entire 
U.S. commercial aviation fleet. Administrator Dixon offers his own perspective as a first officer who was flying that day, as well as that, as, uh, as well as that of other commercial pilots and officials at FAA. Thank you, Secretary Chow, for that inspiring message. You know, like most Americans, I was confused at first about what I saw and heard on the morning of September 11th, 19 years ago today. It took some time for the terrible reality of what happened to sink in. One of the greatest technological achievements on Earth, the U.S. aviation system, had been seized and exploited by terrorists. And thousands of lives were lost, with many thousands more shattered as a result. In a matter of minutes, the trust, reliability, and safety that we spent decades building into our aviation system was gone, and we had no choice but to shut it down. Now at the time, I was the manager of pilot crew scheduling at Delta Airlines, but I also flew the line as a Boeing 727 first officer. We had landed in Cincinnati at about 8.25 a.m., about 20 minutes before the first airplane hit the World Trade Center. I first heard about an airplane hitting the North Tower of the World Trade Center just before 9 a.m., but until I saw the news coverage myself, I had no idea that the airplane was a commercial airliner. Just as my crew began to fully grasp what had happened, the FAA issued the national ground stop and we knew we weren't going anywhere, at least by air. As Secretary Chow said, air traffic controllers then brought in nearly 4,500 aircraft all across this country within the next four hours. The airspace, out of necessity, became the military's and no one knew exactly how long it would stay shut down. For me, I knew I had to get back to lead my team in Atlanta and that we'd have a lot of work to do. So I hopped in a rental car and began the eight hour drive south. After I arrived at the headquarters that evening, I ended up working for four days straight while we supported our diverted aircraft, passengers, and flight crews and worked for the next several days to restart the airline once the airspace opened back up. Now for my deputy administrator and fellow pilot, Dan Elwell, what unfolded that morning was much more personal. At the time, Dan was flying for American Airlines, and among other routes, he regularly piloted Flight 77. On that day, instead of flying, Dan was scheduled to attend an Air Force Reserve promotion ceremony at the Pentagon. As the New York attacks unfolded, he called his office to see if his event would be postponed. The time was 9.38 a.m. He heard Flight 77 hitting the building, and later he found out that his friend in Flight 77 colleague, Chick Burlingame, was the captain of Flight 77. Dan is among the many who lost friends or family that day. Now, my chief of staff, Angela Stubblefield, experienced 9-11 from a totally different perspective. As an Intel Watch officer in the vault in what used to be the FAA Office of Civil Aviation Security. Now, Angela had been at the FAA only two months joining the agency after almost a decade as an intelligence analyst for the U.S. Marine Corps. Her overnight shift was supposed to end at 9 a.m., and about 8.30, the incoming watch officer asked her to come to listen to something, and it was the voice of hijacker Mohammed Atta on American Flight 11 that had just departed Boston. Atta thought he was making announcements to the passengers, when in fact he was transmitting over the radio to ATC. That plane hit the first of the Twin Towers 15 minutes later. What followed for her and the entire FAA Intel team was about 12 hours of nonstop response to calls about potential additional threats, possible hijackings in the U.S. and overseas, as the air transportation and life in general, for that matter, went into suspended animation. When she finally left to drive home on deserted streets, she saw the smoke still rising from the Pentagon. Now, when it was all over, Angela and many others at the FAA and across government and industry played key roles in bringing the air transportation system back from the brink and making it more secure. One of the most enduring legacies from 9-11 was the creation of the Domestic Events Network, or the DEN, 
which essentially is the live phone bridge they set up at the time, 19 years ago, to rapidly share threat information between agencies. The line has been open ever since. Every day, 120 to 175 different entities, including the FAA, are working the DEN. Some participate 24-7, some for 12 or 16 hours a day. And when something unusual happens in the airspace, the DEN allows the FAA to share that information immediately so authorities can respond in a coordinated and timely manner. Improved information sharing and coordination on the DEN are part of the lasting legacy that is now the cornerstone of the U.S. government's response to potential airspace threats. You see, Dan, Angela, and I, and everyone at the FAA, honored the victims and families of 9-11, not by giving in, but by immediately getting back to work with newfound resolve. Everyone jumped in to help and worked tirelessly until the job was done. However, the reality, as we all know, is that the job of airspace security and aviation safety is never done. We and many colleagues across government and industry are still doing that work today and every day. Now, some say you should never look back, but after 9-11, we always keep a watchful eye over our shoulder. We will never forget what happened that day. And it's by looking back that we remember those we lost. And it's also how we salute all the people in the aviation community who served and those who continue to serve to ensure the safety and security of our aviation system. And I'll end with something that Angela said which resonates with me. She told me that every year on September 11th, one person from her 9-11 team starts an email chain to the group sometime between 6 and 8 in the morning. We each reflect on that difficult time, she says, and we marvel at what the team did to respond. We recommit to what some of us are still charged with doing for the flying public. It's contemplative, appreciative, and restorative. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Administrator. You reminded us that one of the hardest challenges for anyone working that day was to keep going despite the loss of friends or family or the uncertainty of not knowing what had happened. Timothy Gaither directs the Transportation Operations Center. Unlike a hurricane or forest fire, which gives advance notice before they strike, the four-plane terror attack came out of the blue, adding immeasurably to the organized chaos of any disaster response. Prior to 9-11, our process was very different. Good morning, my name is Timothy Gaither. I am the Associate Director of the Transportation Operations Center, the department's 24 hours a day, seven days a week operations center that handles all hazards, all incidents of all types. We're the informational hub for the department. And one of the things we like to do is bring folks in and show them a clip from 9-11. It's a 15 to 20 second clip that shows the Department of Aviation Industry impact on 9-11. It shows about 6,000 flights being grounded on that date in about a three hour period. And what it is, is it's 15 to 20 seconds, it shows you. And one thing we've learned from this is that no matter how old folks are, whether they're alive on that day or not, it really impacts them and what they see um, on that screen. And on 9-11, one of the things that did happen was that the department did not have a 24-7 um, op center to kind of handle incidents like this. So one of the things it did is it called in volunteers on that, that, that day to come in and man the desk, so to speak. And we also put folks out at our alternate site that's outside DC 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So the department did not have a structure. What they did is they just pulled as many people as they could together to kind of put together an, you know, an op center to kind of respond to incidents. And from about 2002 to 2004, they developed an op center that they called the Crisis Management Center. This center did not have any procedures, processes, anything in place to truly put together a department response to an incident. And what came from that is a very basic built op center that really was doing some basic work to kind of get us to where we are today. So about 2004 to about 2008, the department really started looking at different ways that they could use this op center. And one of the things that happened was the department moved the op center from our research and special, special programs administration to the pipeline and hazardous material administration and eventually to the office of intelligence security emergency response. And this is really the office that kind of took the lead on structuring how the department responds. 
And one of the things that they did is they created the emergency response team. And this team took on the, the designated role of, you know, folks that could come in and respond to an incident. They knew their roles, they knew what their jobs were, and they would really work to kind of figure out what was, what was going on with the department, what it meant and what it needed to do. And there's three parts that I would like to talk about today. The first one is our leadership. Our leadership is the secretary, tra secretary of transportation, the operating administrators, the deputy secretary, the undersecretary of transportation pilot. This is all the strategic decision makers at the department. And their job is to take whatever information is coming from our operations section and make decisions that in fact, you know, waivers, emergency relief funds and different things of that nature. Our operations section is really broken into two parts. It's our emergency coordinators, which are representatives from each operating administration who work with their industry partners, stakeholders, and also their regional staff to kind of get a good picture of the transportation infrastructure. And on the other side of that is our regional staff who work with our federal emergency management agency partners, the state and local folks downrange to really get that in-depth, in-the-weeds look at what's going on in the transportation infrastructure and how they can assist the governor and the mayors with responding and getting life back to normal. This is the first time when we really saw the department kind of get a structured response to what's going on. And from about 2008 all the way up to about where we are today, what we've seen is the department kind of redo those processes, redo those plans as we've gone through different incidents. We look at, you know, Katrina was a good example of where we came from, where we have 150 people running along like crazy, yelling, screaming, very confusing to our environment that we're at today, where it's very structured, 30, 40 people in the room that know exactly what their roles are and how to move information and decisions and really support the secretary and her, her mission to support the department. And what that means is that we went from a chaotic environment to a very structured environment where everything that the department does, it's, it's continually learning, continually getting better so that the next time there's an incident like 9-11 that we're prepared for it. So 9-11 really became that catalyst that propelled the department to really start looking at what it does, how it does it, and what it can do more for the states and the locals. Thank you. Thank you, Director Gaither. As Tim said, since 9-11, we have moved from chaos to structure. In the earliest days of the Cold War, the FAA practiced grounding all commercial aviation. But it hadn't been done since 1962, when the air fleet was but a fraction of what it is today. On 9-11, Carlesta Mitchell bore witness to what the air traffic controllers and other key FAA officials went through that day. Hi, my name is Carlesta Mitchell. I'm the acting manager of the Washington Operations Center, AXC 100. On the day of 9-11, it was like any other day, any other morning, until we got a call from the Eastern ROC, which is located in New York. They told us that an aircraft had been hijacked. And we thought, what? And he, then that's when they told us, look up, look at your TV. And when we looked up, that's when the first plane hit the tower. And we, we just thought the plane crashed at that time. So we went out, told our manager, and they all came back in and we started our executive verbal notification, making calls, making sure that all of our executives are briefed on this. At that time, also air traffic came in and they set up in our aviation operations center. We st were still making calls and when we looked up again, because we're, we're busy, we're trying to make sure everyone knows what's going on we look up at the television again, and that's when the second plane hit the building, the other twin tower. And we all looked at each other, and in disbelief, we're thinking, we're being attacked. The U.S. is under attack. It's a terrorist attack. And so that's when our manager ran across the hall, and she told the administrator and deputy administrator. All of the executives went into our management operations center, where they were briefed again, and they started reaching out to all the people on the ground. We're still making executive verbal notifications. We call others in to help because now this is bigger than whatever we've ever done. So we've call, we're calling other people in. We start calling our different um, alternate sites. They're bringing them up and some of our other personnel are going out there so they can also help. We're still continuing the, the briefings. And once this be, we're thinking it's a terrorist act, um, our ASH position, which is um, operations, um, their operations division, which was ACO, they came in and they started setting up 
and um, also briefing and trying to find something, what was going on on the ground. So we're still calling other people in and then the administrator comes in and she's talking to the air traffic people and that's when she tells them to ground all planes in the United States. All planes must be grounded now. So the air traffic is now working to ground all planes in the United States. And they're calling more people in, so it's kind of a madhouse in there. But it's like a madhouse with a mission. Everybody knows what they have to do to get all these planes grounded. And they're all working together. But this is something that, you, you know, you're feeling in the air like, oh, my God, this is horrific. From our lessons learned from this is that we needed more capable systems, more automation systems. Um, that's when we, you know, air traffic came up with code words for coming to the DC area, um, working more with the military, better communications. Um, a comp the conference bridge that we set up at the time, which was the tactical net. Now it's called the DIN. It's called the domestic event network. That, that, conference bridge has been online and up since the first plane hit the Twin Tower. That conference bridge has been up. It has never dropped. But we, now we have a more robust system where we can have, at that time, up to 350 participants on the conference bridge, and they're all live. So you have military, you have all the agencies, you have all of the FAA towers and centers on there. So if something happens now, you're getting it faster. Everybody's able to move better because we have faster equipment. Everybody's working so the military knows if something's going on, they're up in the air in, a, in, a, in, a, in moments, at a moment's notice. At that time, everything was manual. So when we got the new operations center, everything was automated. We got a new conferencing system that had the capability of conferencing 350 people. We got an emergency notification system called Emergent. So instead of picking up the phone call, making calls, we were able to automatically um, type them up and send them out so they would go to their phone so they could get notifications more efficient. So now everything is more robust and we're more and we're ready for anything that occurs now in our airspace. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell, for describing what you aptly described as our madhouse with a mission. The Department of Transportation's top mission, as Secretary Chow reminds us, is transportation safety. 9-11 made us consider transportation safety in an entirely new light. Today, we grieve those who were lost. We celebrate those who survived. We thank those who served nobly that day and honor the first responders who ran towards danger in order to help others, even when the two towers in the facade of the Pentagon crumbled around them. America is resilient. On September 14th, the president spoke at ground zero. America was already starting to recover and to respond. In a matter of months, U.S. forces helped Afghans topple the government that had sheltered al-Qaeda. In 2011, Osama bin Laden was tracked to his lair by the U.S. military and killed. It took years to train the warriors who took the battle to Al-Qaeda. All the more remarkable then that the first great victory over the terrorists came at the hands of the crew and passengers of United Airlines Flight 93. In just 23 minutes from the time they first learned that their plane was likely bound on a suicide mission, this cross-section of typical Americans organized a doomed effort to take back the plane and thwarted the terrorists less than 20 minutes from their target in Washington, D.C. East of Shanksville, in another small South Pennsylvania town, speaking of an earlier generation of Americans, President Lincoln said, they died so that others might live. The same can be said in tribute of the 40 men and women, passengers and crew, who struck America's first blow and scored America's first victory against the terrorists. The actions of those aboard Flight 93 represent all that is the best of America, we the living can be proud to serve a country that nurtures, develops, and honors such people. 
we the living can strive to be worthy of those who fell or fought or served on 9-11. This then is our lesson to learn and remember, especially today. On behalf of Secretary Chow and the entire Department of Transportation, thank you for joining us.